this again. There will be, this year they're doing something a little bit different. Rather than having a three or four night, uh, or three night camp meeting in St. Louis, they've divided it up where we have what they call regional camp meetings. And they will be in four different areas of the state. And the one for Southwest Missouri is in Lebanon. And it will be next Thursday night, Friday, and Friday night at Brother Chris Thornton's church. And uh, we'd love to have you be a part of that, Harvest Tabernacle. And uh, it'll be a great way. Now, they've asked us to help. So I'm asking you, they need somebody to help for Thursday night and Friday and Friday night, as much of that as we can handle, to be there and kind of work in the hospitality room, make sure that there's food out for those that's coming and going. I'm not certain what all that will be about and that everything stays neat and tidy. And if you can do that, if you'd like to be a part of that, if you feel like you can give one night or whatever you can give, let us know. And uh, that way we can let them know what all we're able to do. Hallelujah. Everybody got their Valentine box on. Well, let me help you. There's some strawberries in the back. Yeah. <laughs> and the youth would appreciate you purchasing some strawberries. No, we've done, we've done good. We're glad if you can, if you will. Wonderful. Thankful. I'm always thankful for what God is doing. I started a little kind of Wednesday night teaching series a few weeks back. And uh, seven things that God hates, or seven things that's an abomination to God. And uh, I want to continue with that tonight. Now we we started the first night, we talked about um, a proud look. We talked about having a haughty look or a haughty spirit. And, and But pride comes in all different shapes, shades. And uh, some folks are proud because they got lots of money. And some folks are proud because they're poor. Oh, y'all don't know about that right there. We've been so blessed we don't even hardly realize that. But, but some folks take great pride. And some folks take pride in their humility. I don't know that sounds funny to you, but it's true. Pride is just a sneaky thing, and it's one of the things that God says that, that he hates. And uh, the second, last week we talked about a lying, lying tongue. How easy it is for us to lie, how much it's promoted in our society, in our day and time. And... Uh, if we're not careful, it'll sneak in not only to our lives, it'll sneak into the church. And uh, I hear people say all kinds of things that, uh, you know, from folks that just outright just, you know, they just, the old timers used to say, they're windy. But you know, if we're not careful, we can get in the church, we can get talking about, man, you know, we have. 200 here last week. Got 125 maybe, but you no. Know. We had 80, but we'll be talking about, man, we were just, just short of 100. I mean, we were just right here. If we're not careful. We can begin to say things that's really not accurate. Our text comes from Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, and I'll try to, I'll try to hurry and be concise tonight, but, but uh, I'm going to tell you this, that what I began the message with, before I could get finished, God began to speak some things to me, began to tell me some things that needed to be, be said. And so, at first, you might say, yeah, oh, ooh, go ahead, pastor, preach it. Before we get done, you might say, ooh, ooh, ouch. I don't know. I don't know where you'll, where you'll fit in. But Proverbs 6, 16 says, these six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Proud book, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. 
a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Hello. Come on. <laughs> we talk about being a holy people. I believe if we can do this right here, it will help us on our path to being a holy people. If we can get these things through that, these are things that God absolutely hates. I made mention, I can't remember if it was last week or week before, but I made mention of the fact that somebody asked me, is, is all sin the same? And I said, yes and no. Yes, that God hates anything that's not what he wants it to be, but I have a hard time conceiving that going 56 and a 55 is equivalent with taking somebody's life. So maybe the answer is, yes, it's all an offense to God, but there are different outcomes in your life based on what things that you do. Psalms 94 and 20 through verse 23 is going to kind of concisely say what we're going to talk about tonight, which is, look at your hands. Hands that shed innocent blood. Psalms 94 verse 20 says, Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? You think about that. They gather themselves together against the soul of righteousness and condemn the innocent blood. A law that condemns innocent blood. But the Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock of my refuge. And he shall bring upon them their own iniquity. Now, this is what happens. This is what happens when we make a law that sheds innocent blood. He shall bring upon them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Yea, the Lord our God shall cut them off. In the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about one of the hottest political and spiritual topics of all time. If you could just set aside your, your, your political uh, party, your political ambitions or thoughts about, about politics and all of that stuff, and if you could just pay attention to what God's Word says, I want to talk to you about one of the things that is killing humanity faster than we can imagine. I want to talk to you about abortion. The sanctity of life is the idea that all human life is a gift from God. All human life is a gift from God. It doesn't matter what the race it came from. It doesn't matter the country that it came from. It doesn't matter the religion that it was born to. All humanity, all flesh is important to God. There are approximately 1.2 million abortions that are done in America alone every single year. 1.2 million people that shed innocent blood at the hands of another human being. Woo! <laughs> mm. Killing people and justifying ourselves in the process. I believe every doctor, every nurse, every facilitator that brings about the act of abortion yes. will stand in a judgment and give an account for every single life that they took. Yes. You might count me wrong. You might dismiss me right here. You might get up and leave this place and say I'm not coming back. But what I'm saying is that we are responsible for the humanity that God has given every one of us. I believe that every congressperson that writes a law or votes a law in to enable and to fund abortions will have innocent blood on their hands. 
I didn't come to condemn somebody. If you had an abortion, this ain't here to condemn you and, and wallow you into a corner and beat you up. What I'm hoping that happens, if you haven't already, is that you repent. You ask God to forgive you and let him wash that off of your slate so that you're not carrying that load the rest of your life. It's not that God can't forgive you. It's just being willing to admit that you made a mistake and that God can forgive you. Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 2. If I can read just the first part of it. It says, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. Jeremiah 1 and 5 says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. That's right. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee <laughs> and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. God seen every one of us before we was ever born. Before we ever gasped breath into our lungs, God seen us. God looked down upon us, and he had a plan for you and I. He had a purpose for us. He seen us more than waiting till we were just born. America begins to date, debate the issue every year, especially around election times. The question is often argued is, when does life begin? Well, some folks will say, well, I just don't believe life begins until they're born and they take breath. Some people will say, well, I don't believe it begins until they reach a certain point that they can they have a heartbeat or there's a certain point that they do this or that. And a lot of these arguments come from way back before medical science was where it is and we could see what's happening in the womb. But I believe in my own life and in my own thought process that we are born or we become life, not born, we become life at the day of conception. Not five days later, not ten days later, not three months later, not five months later. I believe that when the seed is planted, that suddenly the egg begins to take form and it begins to form a life. DNA begins to happen right then. The debate rages in the media around, well, what about the health of the mother? Do you know that the health of the mother, rape and incest all together only account for 3% of all the abortions that's performed every year? I think it's a weak argument. Yeah. 18 days after conception, the heart begins to beat on its own. Six weeks, the fetus quickly moves in the womb. Brain waves are present at eight weeks. A child grabs, swims freely, and the heartbeat is measurable. Twelve weeks, it begins to cry. It sucks its thumb. It sleeps. It wakes. All the organ system functions, including the mental, are in place. And they can feel pain at that point. From this point on, nothing new develops. Just everything begins to grow until it's able to make its way out into the world. The Bible debate that Dr. Ken Hovind from Creation Science Evangelism says, I know 35-year-old men who are still having to be taken care of by mom and dad. If the thing is that it's after the child is born and is no longer part of the body, that it is then becomes life, I don't believe that's truth. I believe it is life right from the beginning. The Word of God declares that personhood of a child is yet in the womb. We understand that when Jesus met John the Baptist, he was in the womb of his mother Mary, and John was in the, in the, in the womb of his mother Elizabeth. And when the two came together, they neither seen each other, but John kicked in the womb as he realized he had come into the presence of Almighty God. There is life that happens in the womb long before a child is born. Psalms 139.15 says, My substance was not hid from thee when I was made a secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine ears did see my substance, and yet being unperfect and in thy book, all my members were written 
which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Let me break that down into simpleness for all of us. What they were saying was, before I had even a member here or there, before my little fingers were formed and my toes and my ears and my nose, my mouth, my, my body was even being formed, that God already seen me as a human being. Yes, sir. That God was already looking at me and he was already loving me. And even though I wasn't perfectly shaped and formed yet, in his mind, I was already a human being. The devaluing of human life through abortion is now beginning to spill over into other parts of our society. You wonder why it's so easy for a child to step into a school with a gun and begin to unload that gun into other children. I'm going to tell you, it started way back a few decades ago when we said human life is not important until we say it is. That child can't differentiate that. That child says, if I can put away a kid when it's before it's ever born, why can I not put away this child? All right. All right. It spills over into every area of our society if we're not careful. It's not guns that's the issue. It's the mentality and the value that we have put upon human life. That's why we have trouble. The worst part of it is it doesn't just stop right there. But now what we see beginning to happen that some believe will eventually overtake even abortion is the fact that we will begin to kill our elderly. Yes. Right. Hello? Yeah. Right. Your value isn't as much as it used to be. You can't produce what you can used to produce. You can't do what you could once do. We can't afford to take care of you anymore, so let's just put you out of our misery. This is what happens when we break down the wall of the value of human life. This is why, I hate to say it, but this is why there are nationalities of people and religious beliefs that can strap a bomb on a child and send him someplace and destroy him because the value of human life has been brought down to such a limit and such a low that we believe, oh, it doesn't matter. Abortion invites God's wrath into our lives. The Bible is plain. When innocent blood is shed, God brings wrath upon that nation or upon that people. 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 3 and 4, tells us that God will not pardon the shedding of innocent blood. Let me read it to you. Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah... To remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did. For also, and also for the innocent blood that he shed. For he filled Jerusalem with the innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. Well, Pastor, what did Manasseh do? What was it that he shed innocent blood about? Well, we don't know everything that he did. But what we do know is that Manasseh was known as one of the most evil kings that ruled. Matter of fact, you'll find oftentimes in the Word of God, it will talk about, and, he, and the king did such and such, but not to the level that Manasseh led the people astray. Well, what did Manasseh do that would have made God so angry at him? Well, one is that he brought other gods into the kingdom that his father had shoved out. He brought them back in, but one of the ones he brought in was Molech. Anybody, oh, anybody ever heard that saying, holy moly? Yeah. <laughs> I probably said that a few times, holy moly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, moly wasn't holy because ho moly was moly. So what about, what happened with Molech? What was, what was the deal with Molech? By the way, can I tell you that this same spirit is rising up for that same God in 2020? Molech was a god that they sacrificed their children to. They would bring them and kill them or pass them through the fire to destroy them. This is one of the reasons why God hated Manasseh so much. Because he was shedding innocent blood and he didn't just do it for himself. But he led the children of Israel and said, come on. Bring your children. Let's kill them together and give them to Molech as an offering. 
God hates it when we shed innocent blood. It's one of the seven things that he hates. Hands that shed innocent blood. The Lord said that he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood. God said that this innocent blood was a serious issue. The scripture tells us that Manasseh was hated and often used as a high water mark, high water mark for evil in the kingdom. I believe that God's grieved over the abortions that happen in our world and in our nation. Yes, Psalm chapter 106, verse 37 through 40 says, Yea, they sacrifice their sons and their daughters to devils and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Thus were they defiled with their own works and went a whoring with their own inventions. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. You might not think it's important as long as you're not participating. And I'm glad if you're not. Thank God we don't want you to. But I believe when we roll over and play dead and act like nothing's going on when our nation is steadily pushing towards abortion, 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 and now it's not just at, at this number of weeks or this number of days or, or this trimester or that trimester, but now it's reached to the point that the mother right up until the birth, waiting to deliver, can decide mm, yes or mm, no. As a nation, we have accepted and made rules and laws that say this is acceptable as a nation to us. I believe that God is looking at our hands and he's saying, I don't accept hands that shed innocent blood. I believe it's time that we start talking and saying, God, forgive us as let this happen. So what do we do? We seek God's forgiveness as a nation. Chronicles 7, 14 says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I'll hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. Oh Elected officials that will try to stop the moral mudslide will begin to arise. We need to allow God to do what's in God's hand and that is He's the giver of life. And he's the taker of life. But then the Lord began to speak to me about another part of abortion. This one's seldom talked about or even acknowledged. But God believes it's just as serious. I believe God is grieved by the people that call themselves Christians. That are aborting spiritual babies. Come on. Yes. Yes. We can take a holier than thou. Righteous than thou. Aspect and say we don't participate in aborting babies. We're not part of that. We believe against that. But yet I wonder how many people. Have lost their spiritual life. In the hall or in the aisle. Or in between the pews. Because somebody wasn't sensitive enough. And they afforded that child. That spiritual child. Before they ever came forward. You can argue over when spiritual life begins in someone. But I believe it is long before they're ever born again. I believe conception happens long before they're ever born again. There is a time period that we are carrying people in the spiritual womb. And if we're not careful, we will allow ourselves to say and do things that will destroy that soul. And they never walk back in the house of God, of God again. Some would say maybe it just happens when they repent. But I would be inclined to believe that it could happen as early as when the seed of the gospel first penetrates the heart. Maybe before they've ever repented and said, God, I'm sorry for anything, but the seed of the gospel has met that spot and all of a sudden something begins to happen. 
I believe when people fight in the house of God, when people cause a fight with the man of God, when people are doing things, speaking about one another or ridiculing one another, that there is something that's happening in the spirit realm that can abort the soul that is affected by what they've heard. Well, I know this is a tough part right here. Isaiah 66 and 7 says this, Before she travailed, you ever been around a, a woman that's having a baby? I'm not talking to a woman that's got the epidural, you know, and can sit there and high five. I'm talking about a woman that doesn't have any pain relief. She begins to travail. She begins to say, Woo! Ugh! You're a man, you don't know whether to squeeze her hand, stand close, or stand far away. You might get swatted, you might, don't get told what will happen. But the scripture says, before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? In other words, long before there is a birth around these altars, long before someone bows their knees or some, before they humble themselves before God, there is something that's happened in the spiritual realm. And God said, I know if you haven't seen it. I know you don't understand it. But it happened way back there somewhere. Maybe it was five minutes. Maybe it was three months ago. Maybe it was six years ago. Maybe it was nine years ago. I don't know how long ago it happened. But somewhere along the way, our conception began. He finished out that saying, For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. You might be thinking to yourself, Well, I've been praying for my kids for 20 years. I've been praying for my kids for 10 years. I've been praying for them for five years. Can I tell you tonight that whenever you started travailing, they might not have been born right then, but there was some conception that took place and there was a something that was put into the womb. Yes. You know what happens is we get impatient. Though. Oh, come on, do it now. Come on. You know, I'm going to drag you down there. Uh -huh. We abort that thing before it's ever born. They're still in the womb. They might be born in just a short amount of time, but nevertheless, they haven't been born yet. They're just in the conceived. They're just the, the fetus, the spiritual fetus, so to speak. They might not be talking in tongues, but they're still in the womb. They're still in the place of being carried and being loved on. And the church is often considered to be the mother and Christ the father. We as a church are responsible for those that come up in this place to make sure that they're taken care of and they're safeguarded. Sure. Have you ever seen a mother that loves her child? She ain't going to let you get up close to her and be swapping on her. Uh -huh. She ain't going to be letting you punch her in the belly. She ain't going to be letting you do all that kind of stuff. You know why? Because she loves what's inside of her. And she's going to make sure it's protected until it's born. However long that takes. It might come early, it might come late, but she's protecting that thing. She's keeping it safe. She's building some safeguards around it. She's doing some things to be healthy. She's eating healthy. She's loving healthy so that the baby is loved. They tell me that the children can hear in the womb. And that's why it's so important to say wonderful things to them. You say, oh, that's just a bunch of talk. I believe what you're saying to that child that's inside of you. Father. If you're saying that something to that child that your wife is carrying, that child is here and you're speaking to that thing. You're speaking to it. I'm going to love you. I'm going to care about you. I'm so glad you're coming into our lives. I'm so glad you're going to be a part of our family. I believe there's some people that they speak things into their children before they ever breathe air. They say things like, I can't afford to have you. I don't want to mess with you. You're going to inconvenience my life. You're going to keep me up late at night. They say these things, and then they wonder what happened to that child inside of them. I'm going to tell you right now that the church better be protecting the babies that come in. Right. You better be protecting those that had not been born yet, but they're just here, and they're listening, and they're hearing what God's saying, but they had not been born yet. 
Oh, but pastor, somebody needs to tell them, get them straightened out. They need to let them know what we're about, what we're against, what we're for, what we want to do. Better be careful. You might be shedding some innocent blood before you know it. You might have some blood on you. I got to finish. I don't want our spiritual womb to become barren because we get impatient and we abort what God puts in place. If we can learn to get our hands off that baby, it'll come forth. And the more we can be trusted with the pregnancy, the more pregnant the church will become. I believe that some churches are never able to step into the revival that's promised because when the revival shows up, it doesn't look like what they're expecting at the moment. But I believe God has a harvest that's large and it's diverse and it's waiting to be brought forth. And I see people coming in. And I see souls coming to the, to the place. I'm thinking, God, let's protect them. Let's put arms around them. Let's love them. Let's keep them from getting to them. If they come up here to around the front, be careful how they're treated. Don't get your hands up on top of them and start shaking their head to their the necks falling loose on them. Be spitting on them while you're trying to pray for them. God's just as powerful when I speak like this as when I'm yelling. You just put your hand up there. Maybe not on their head, maybe on their back. Maybe you might just ask them, can I pray for you? Can I love you a little bit? Can I tell you how good God is? Begin to love them and care for them. This is why small groups is going to be so important for this. It's a non-invasive place where they can be loved until they're God's looking for some people that are ready to go to the mat to protect those that have not been born but they've been conceived. You've been hearing me say on Sundays, Sunday morning specifically, to our guests that come in, we love you. We pray for you to get here. We've been praying for you. I believe every person that comes into the kingdom of God, somebody Pray for them somewhere along the way. I pray that God sends people here continually. I pray, God, let them find this place. Dispatch angels around this city. There's people that's dying right now, wishing that somebody would give them life and hope. And they don't even know where to go. They've been confused about all this place and that place. And here there's a place that they can find safety and love. I believe God's looking. That say, you can count on us to love those that haven't been born yet. I believe if you look, think back about your past, everyone that's here, there's somebody that prayed for you before you ever got here. There was a mother, a father, a grandmother, a grandfather, a neighbor, an uncle, a niece, somebody your name out. And that's why you're here. Because there was a seed that was planted. And you was conceived that you weren't born yet. I tell the story of my great grandmother, Lauren. She was a praying woman. She had 13 children. If I had 13 children, I'd be a praying man. Back in the days when big families were normal, wasn't a big deal like we think about it today. She had 13 children and they worked on a farm and my grandmother told me that, that they never even knew there was a depression in the 40s. They didn't have any money to start with to buy anything. They lived off the land so they just didn't know. But they tell the story that my grandmother, my great grandmother, excuse me, that she would go out and there was a little breezeway that was between the house and the the kitchen like they used to do so that if the kitchen caught on fire there was a chance that they could keep the house from catching on fire. And she would get in that little breezeway and she would begin to pray and she would pray and she would pray for her 13 children and she would call them by name. 
But then she would pray further than that. She'd pray for their wives, their husbands. And then she would pray further than that. She would pray for their children. And then she would pray for her children, their children's children. And she would pray for the next generation. And they said she would pray for great-grandchildren that had never been born, not weren't even thought about yet. But she was already bombarding heaven. And she was praying, God, let them be the one. God, let them be full of the Holy Ghost. God, let them be a part of the kingdom of God. She was tearing down walls. I'm telling you, your prayers are important. They will give birth. When Zion travails, they will bring forth sons and daughters. Today, today, not all, not even close to all, but a huge percentage of her descendants live for God. Many of them pastors, ministers of some sort. I don't think that's an accident. I don't think it happened by accident. I think God heard a prayer and there was something that was started way back there, long before the person ever brought forth life. She was praying for him. I pray that the spirit of repentance and travail would fall upon me and upon this church as we ask God to forgive us for every time that we've shed innocent blood by aborting a spiritual child. For every time that we spoke caustic things that killed the unborn. I pray that we commit ourselves to God that that God's given us to love those that are unlovable maybe that don't look like talk like, walk like, smell like us but they're still waiting to be born I believe God's looking for people that he can trust with new babies you can stand Paul said I will travail again until Christ be formed in you. Pastor, what can I do? Maybe I made a mistake somewhere along the way. Maybe I said something I shouldn't have said. Maybe I did something that offended or whatever. We can't change that. That's in the past. We, we have to leave it behind. <clears throat> Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching for those things which are ahead. But what we can do is we can Fail again. God, give us spiritual babies. Fill this house up with people. We'll love them and protect them. We won't let anybody destroy them. We won't let anybody mess them up. We're going to love them and care for them. Paul said, I'll travail again. It's time for us to travail again and say, God, give us new babies. I believe revival is waiting. It's been promised. It's been promised. It's here. This city's ready for more revival. It's ready to see what God's going to do. We're not putting down anything in the past. We're just saying we want a new revival to hit this place. I'm asking every one of you to just put your hands up right now. We're fixing to pray together. If you're watching us online tonight, we're so thankful that you've been with us. We're asking you to bow your head wherever you're at. You might want to lift your hands if it's appropriate where you're at. But we're going to pray right now. First, we're going to pray a prayer of repentance. And then we're going to ask God to begin to minister and let revival flow wherever you're at and hear where we're at. Father, I ask you right now to forgive us. Any life that we have taken physically or spiritually, God, I ask you right now to forgive us. It wasn't intentional. We didn't mean to do it. We're so sorry things that we might have said, things that we might have done that, that destroyed. Please forgive us. And we ask that you would allow that person, if possible, to make their way back to the house of God because, Lord, we promise we're going to love them and care for them and take care of them. God, I ask you to forgive us for anything in our lives that's unpure, unholy, unrighteous. And God, that we would be able to take and walk into what you're doing right here and right now. God, we're believing for the revival that you have promised, not only here, but many places around the world that's waiting, as you have said that you'll bring forth revival. We speak revival there. We speak revival here. We speak revival in this nation. Forgive us as a nation for the lives that we have taken. Forgive us, God, for writing laws that would help to promote killing our own children. Innocent, 
blood that's on our hands. God, we repent of turning a blind eye and a deaf ear and acting like it wasn't happening. But God, we believe right now that you will forgive us and you will turn toward us again. We humble ourselves before you. We ask you to hear us, oh God. I pray right now that you would send forth a revival that you have promised in 2020. Right now, starting today, not next week or next year, but today, God, we entrust you to bring forth a great harvest here. You said the fields are white and ready for harvest. Even as we're praying and speaking, we believe it to happen. We thank you for what you're doing. And we ask you, God, to do the miraculous among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We're going to sing together. You just lift your hands right here as Brother Grant leads us in a song. I'll say yes.